Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here at Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And I have a question for you this morning. What do you think is the most popular, okay, the most popular, most quoted Bible verse in the world? Most quoted, said by the most people. There's somebody in the room with you right now. Kind of look at them and just kind of tell them what you think. Tell them what you think is the most popular verse. All right, so who thought it was John 3.16? Well, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm sure it's popular in the church. I'm sure it's popular amongst Christians, but not in the world. There's a whole host of verses that the world says all the time that are much more popular than John 3.16. Some of them you probably hear every single day. Uh, verses like, fight the good fight. That's from 1 Timothy. A wolf in sheep's clothing, Matthew 7. Rise and shine, that's Isaiah 60. The powers that be, that's Romans 13. Let's go the extra mile, Matthew 5. By the skin of your teeth, that's Job 19. A fly in the ointment, Ecclesiastes 10. Give up the ghost, John 19. Suffer fools gladly, 2 Corinthians 11. The blind leading the blind. Matthew 15. But what about this one? Matthew 7, 1. Do not judge or you will be judged. You ever heard that one? You ever had a non-believer or a non-Christian tell you that one? Ah, 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 remember, do not judge. How dare you say that? Right? That's what they're saying. How dare you say that my lifestyle or my choice is sinful? Didn't your own Jesus tell you not to judge? Yep, got me there. Jesus actually did say that, didn't he? <laughs> Non-Christians know this verse and they use this verse. They quote it back to us. Your own Bible says, do not judge. Okay, so let's read it. This comes from the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew chapter seven. Let's read it because I think we should understand it. Jesus says, Judge not, that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. During Jesus' own earthly ministry, Jesus had a lot of run-ins with the religious leaders, and they were called the Pharisees. And these men were very well versed in the scriptures. They were very zealous about following down to the letter of the law, but at the same time, they were always looking for loopholes that allowed them to not break the law, but perhaps violate the reason why the law was made, the spirit of the law. Plus, they often showed zero compassion toward their fellow man. At the same time, they were pompous and they acted holier than thou because they wanted to be praised by others. Jesus often told them that their behavior was wrong, and that instead they should display justice and mercy and faithfulness. And he said those things are more important. So Jesus called them hypocrites. So hypocrisy, though, is not the same as judgment. For example, it's hypocrisy to teach that drunkenness is a sin if the person teaching it gets drunk every weekend. That would be hypocrisy. But it's not hypocrisy to teach that drunkenness is a sin. So there's another part in that passage that's a little confusing. He says, do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What does that mean? See, back in Jesus' day, dogs weren't domesticated like we know them. Dogs often ran in packs and they were wild. Dogs exhibited predatory behavior, and they would do everything they could to survive, which included hanging out in the garbage dumps and sometimes even eating dead bodies. And pigs, well, 
pigs have always been unclean animals. So when Jesus is teaching this, he's saying, hey, don't act superior. Don't puff yourself up. The world might be moving that way, but you should not. Watch out for those evil feelings because they will devour you. As children of God, we should strive to be holy. We should hate what is evil, cling to what is good. But Jesus doesn't want us to do that with a superior attitude. He wants us to do it without judgment. So what would be hypocritical judgment? Because that's really what Jesus is teaching against. Well, according to Jesus, that would be when we point out someone's sin and we don't address our own. Because let's all agree, we can use the word judgment in a couple of different ways. But I don't think Jesus is saying that both ways are wrong. On the one hand, Christians can be judgmental and we can act superior to others. We can push our way around, we can act higher, we can act holier than thou, and, and that's wrong. That is wrong. But the other kind of judgment is when we use discernment. Philippians 1 says, you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. John 7 says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So there's two choices, right? There's two options that we get, what is right and what is wrong. Those, uh, those choices are, are discernment. We, yes, yes, we should be able to discern what is right and what is wrong. Jesus is not teaching against discernment. Or, or helping other people overcome sin. Instead, he is telling us not to be so prideful and so, so convinced of our own goodness that we end up criticizing other people from this position of self-righteousness. But before we remove that speck, right, there's work to do. Before we remove that speck from our brother's eye, we should do some introspection first. We should correct our own shortcomings. So when someone reminds you, hey, 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 didn't Jesus tell you not to judge? You can tell them, yes, he did. It's true. But ironically, <laughs> right? Ironically, when someone tells you that you're wrong for judging, aren't they then doing the exact same thing? In that moment, aren't they also at the same time saying that you are wrong and they are right? So yes, yes. It's a popular passage, but it's misquoted. Everyone judges. It's not wrong to judge, but you can judge incorrectly. Listen to what Jesus says in the book of Matthew. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. That's the same exact passage, isn't it? That's the same teaching as the sawdust and plank passage, isn't it? Jesus agrees with non-Christians, and we should too. But Jesus isn't saying not to judge. He is saying not to be a hypocrite. And, and sadly, we all struggle with hypocrisy. So this summer, let's push the reset button on judgment. You know, we're talking about making a fresh start pushing that reset button, starting over, let's push the reset button on being judgmental. Let's learn to make proper, sound judgments between right and wrong and do a little better when it comes to judging other people. Because it's illogical not to judge. We all do it. We all do it every day. But we can make reasonable judgments and not the ones that come from a sense of moral superiority. We, we should be different than the world. We, we should act different. We should talk different. But it shouldn't come across as being better than someone else. 1 Peter 1 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I am called to be different. I am. I am called to be different. And if I'm called to be different, then the question is, am I? Am I? What do you, what do you think? 
Should Christians watch what they do? Should they watch what they say, how they act? Are they different? So how do I practice discernment in my own life? How do I point that judgmental finger back at myself and remove the, the log that is in my own eye? I am holy, but not holier, right? I am holy, but I'm not holier. Peter reminds us, be holy as Christ is holy. Was Jesus holy? Yes, he was, but he was also humble. He took the last seat at the table. He washed the feet of his employees. What does that mean? It means do everything you can to remove the plank from your own eye first. It means you do the work here. You do the work on yourselves. We have the discussion. We listen first. As Christians who are holy, that means I make good judgments about what I do and what I allow in my life. Yes, the world is heading in the wrong direction. You are right. The world is heading in the wrong direction. But I make sure that, like Joshua 24 says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord first. You take care of you and yours first. Do you need an example? Um, my two sons, my boys, they only watch YouTube supervised. Because we know there's a lot of horrible things out there. Why do I use this example? Because how we raise our kids is a form of discernment. It's an example of me taking care of the plank that is in my own eye first. I am discerning how I raise my own children first before I judge other people about how they raise their children. Romans 12 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Holiness is how you run your life. Holiness is how you run your business. Holiness is how you handle your money. Holiness is when you go to the movies or when you turn on the TV or the music that you listen to. Is it adding to your holiness? Are you being discerning about how you spend your money, how you run your business, how you raise your children, the movies you watch, the entertainment that gets brought into your household? Are you being discerning? Are you making good judgments? Jesus says, before you go acting holier than thou, make sure that you are first holy. Make sure that you've already removed the plank from your own eye. I think we need to listen to Jesus. I think we need to listen to Peter when he says, you shall be holy for I am holy. Why? Because it's getting harder and harder to tell the difference between those who are Christian and those who are not. If we are different, we should be different. We should act differently. We should talk differently. And if we can't, if we don't, then that's troubling. Being a Christian should make you different. Jesus should make a difference in your life. G.K. Testerson said, tolerance is the virtue of a man without conviction. This last Monday, uh, our men's Bible study, we were reading Philippians chapter four, verse one, and it says, therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Let me tell you something. I believe in this passage. I believe Christians should stand firm. They should still hold the line. And, and we should not be accepting of everything just because the world is. Just let me let you in on a little secret, okay? The world isn't always right. How dare you judge? How dare you say that my actions or my lifestyle or my choices are sinful? Didn't your own Jesus tell you not to judge? How do you respond? Is this teaching of Jesus really meant to keep us from pointing out the differences between right and wrong? Should we finally just join culture and just adopt a new definition of tolerance? Should Christians just be accepting of 
all opinions and all thoughts and all actions and should we just make them equally valid? What do we do? Jesus tells you, be holy. Do the inward work first. Remove the plank from your own eye first. So that's what I should do. Here's what I shouldn't do. Christians should not be the morality police. Romans 2 says, You have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Now, that's the New Testament. Okay, that's a New Testament passage. Even the Old Testament agrees. Look at Isaiah 33. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Psalm 75, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up the other. I am not the morality police. Do you know why? Because God is. God is. And when I pull someone over and I write them a ticket, what I'm doing, in effect, is two different things. I am, one, showing contempt for God. Because what I'm saying is, God, you're, you're taking way too long to convict this person. So I'm going to pull over, I'm going to pull them over, and I'm going to write them a ticket. I, I'll do it, right? I'll do it, God. You're taking too long. And the second thing that's wrong here, the author of Romans says, for in passing judgment on another person, you condemn yourself. I don't think I need to explain that <laughs> to you. I, I get that. I don't want that. Third, Christians are not to judge each other on non-essentials. What does that mean? It means other Christians. We don't judge other Christians on non-essentials. Romans 14 says one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despises the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. You know, there's a lot of things that Christians, we, each other, us, the church, that we disagree on. That's why we have denominations, right? All these denominations, uh, we, sh we should share universal beliefs, right? We should share universal beliefs, but we fracture we fracture off into these little subcategories of Christianity. Christians disagree about how to baptize someone, adults versus infants, about the way we interpret the Bible, uh, what we mean when we say divinely inspired. Christians disagree about whether women should teach or be pastors, whether gays should be allowed to marry or who should be allowed to receive communion in the church. We disagree on issues like capital punishment and divorce and abortion and immigration and gun control and racism. Is that what Jesus had in mind when he created the church? When Jesus prays in the garden, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their world that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. Jesus prayed that the church would be one, singular. But there's been conflict in the church since the beginning of the church. I'm reminded of a joke that I heard uh, many years ago uh, a man is stranded on a deserted island for a number of months, and he's all by himself. He's alone. And finally, a rescue boat shows up, and the man who's there says, hey, before you take me away, I want to give you a tour of the island. And he takes them up to three different grass huts, and he says, this one's my home, and this one's my church. And one of the rescuers was curious, and he asked him, he says, well, what about that third hut? What's that? And the lone survivor on the island said, oh, that's my last church. I left it because I didn't agree with the people that worship there. One of my favorite John Wesley quotes is, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. He's saying that there is a core set of beliefs that we can all agree on. Some things we will not agree on, but those are non-essential. So let us all just focus on 
loving one another. Fourth, Christians should not judge other people's motives. 1 Corinthians 4 says, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. There was a grocery store clerk who wrote once to Ann Landers, and she was complaining about all the things that she had seen people buy with food stamps. She was complaining that they were buying luxury items. She said, I saw one lady uh, buy a chocolate cake, and then saw another lady buy uh, a huge bag of shrimp. And she said, I can't believe the people on uh, welfare, people on food stamps are so wasteful. They should buy things that are, you know, essential only. A couple weeks later, Ann Landers' column was completely devoted to responses back to that grocery store clerk. One woman wrote, I didn't buy a cake, but I did buy a big bag of shrimp with food stamps. So what? My husband had been working at a plant for 15 years when it shut down, and the shrimp casserole I made was for our wedding anniversary dinner, and it lasted us three days. Perhaps the grocery clerk who criticized that woman would have a different view of life after walking a mile in my shoes. Another woman wrote, I'm the woman who bought the $17 cake and paid for it with food stamps. I thought the checkout woman in the store would burn a hole through me with her eyes. What she didn't know is that the cake was for my little girl's birthday and she has bone cancer and she will probably be gone in six to eight months and this cake will be her last. 1 Samuel 16 says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. There is no way any of us can know exactly what someone is doing or what their motivations are. We can save ourselves and other people a lot of grief if we would quit altogether trying to figure out somebody else's hidden motive or their behavior, and instead, just love them and accept them. Fifth, Christians are not to judge unbelievers. Wait, 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 wait. Now, I know that one's not true, right? First Corinthians 5 says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. The scripture is clear. The role of Christians is to love, to accept, to forgive unbelievers through our kindness, and then we lead them to repentance for their sin. But God alone is the judge of people. He alone knows the motives of people's hearts. He alone knows the proper time for judgment, and he will perfectly respond to sin. You know, we started this off by saying that we all thought John 3.16 was the most quoted verse. And we all know it, right? We all know it. We can all quote it. But can we quote the next verse? John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Listen, if Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, then what business is it of mine to do so? And yet, still, the question hangs out there. When is it okay to judge? Is there an appropriate time for Christians to judge? When can we judge others? Well, you can. You can. You can judge others, but it's not going to be the answer that you think. Number six, Christians are to judge themselves. 1 Corinthians 11 says, But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Paul calls upon us to judge ourselves, to examine the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we think in the light of God's word and in the light of what the Holy Spirit shows us. 
in light of what the Holy Spirit is convicting us. This is what I believe Jesus is getting at when he says, get that plank out of your own eye first before you go around pointing out specks in other people's eyes. Even before we take communion. Did you know that? Paul tells us that we should be introspective before we take communion. He says, let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat of the bread and drink the cup. The focus of our judging is to be on us. The change that, that we are so concerned about should be the change in ourselves. First, we judge ourselves. We confess our sin. We deal with our sin. And if we do that, then we know that we have done the work. And then Christians are to judge the church. Yeah. Let's go back to a verse that we read already. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. That's a crucial verse that we often miss. Paul says, what are you judging people on the outside for? Why are you judging non-Christians? They don't know right from wrong, but you do. Right? The highest standard is not out there. We don't hold them to the highest standard. No, the highest standard is here. The highest standard is on us. Why should we judge other Christians? Because if they're claiming to be a Christian, then they are claiming to represent God. And when people claim to be Christians, and then they go against the law of God, we have to do what we can to restore them. Well, it's not my business. I, I don't know. Those are my friends. I don't, that's not my business. Now, we might say that. But it is your business. It's your business because this is God's house. You are God's family. Listen, the thing that makes the church work is that we are family. It, 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 it's not only our business, it's our responsibility. It's our loving responsibility. Always in love. 1 Corinthians 16 says, let all you do be done in love. So the goal, right? The goal of going to that other person is restoration. That's the goal. Not punishment. Judge, being judgmental, that's punishment. Discernment is restoration. Restoration is loving. Remember, Jesus leaves the 99 sheep in search of the one to what? Restore them. Bring them back into the fold. He doesn't say, well, good riddance. Right? That one is always a troublemaker. That one's always going off. Let them learn their lesson. Good, good riddance. Goodbye. No. Jesus goes back to what? To bring them back. To restore them. So often I see people scolded. I see them reprimanded. I see them told that they're lost, told that they're broken, told that they're doing it wrong. And then that, per that person gets embarrassed. That person gets their feelings hurt. And that person leaves. And then the group that they left never goes after them, never seeks them out, never tries to restore them. That's not what God wants. The goal of correction is love. Galatians 6 says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. You see, this is, this is why we do the inward work first. This is why we remove the plank from our own eye first, because we need a teachable heart. We must be willing to receive correction also. When it's our turn, someone might come to you and say, you have failed to live up to God's standards. So what we do is we begin the process of change in us first. We do the things that God expects in us first. So that when the world sees me, when the world hears me, when the world sees what I do, hears my voice, when they see my actions, they see Jesus first. That'd be great, right? To be holy, not holier, 
but holy. That'd be great. But I'm not perfect, right? I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. First Timothy says the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Guess what? The good news is nobody expects you to be perfect. I know Christians think that we need to be holier than thou, but nobody's asking you to be. Nobody expects you to be. In fact, they don't want you to be. Really, that's not what the world outside wants. No, what the world outside wants from Christians is to be honest, to be real, to be authentic, transparent. And that when we fall, when we sin, when we have a moment of weakness, then we are honest about it, that we admit it, or that we would even openly put it out on display, put it out into the public, openly. Why? So the world can see God's mercy. So the world can see God's plan of forgiveness. So the world can see what going after the one looks like. Listen, instead of being a fake person who says they never sin and looks down on those who do, we need to show the world that the church is made up of real people. People who also make mistakes. People who also sin. But we don't come here to to be perfect and sit in a little perfect party. No, we come here because we admit we need correction. We don't need judgment. We don't need finger pointing. No, we gather here because we need Jesus. Hebrews 12 says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, the only one who can make us perfect is Jesus. I want you to do some introspection right now. Close your eyes. Close your eyes and just take a moment right now. As we've been talking, you've probably had some names or faces or groups or images pop up in your head. That group that kicked you out and nobody came back for you. Nobody looked for you. Nobody tried to restore you or to see how you were doing. It feels like nobody misses you those feelings that you feel, those relationships that were broken. Forgive them. Forgive them in your heart. Take a deep breath and let that pain go. Or that person that left your group, that person that you no longer see. They left your group. They moved away. They left your company. They left your church. Forgive them. Maybe it's time you reached out to them Maybe it's time to admit that the wrong steps were taken. Ask Jesus if maybe you should go after them, that you should restore them. Is there someone who needs us to be Jesus, to seek and to save the lost? Loving Father, thank you that your word is powerful and effective. It's living and active. 
you promised that I do not need to be anxious about anything, but in every situation, I should present my request to you. So I lift up the relationships before you today. Lord, and ask you to bring restoration and healing. Replace my fear with faith in you. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard my heart and my mind. Thank you that you know me, that you love me. You know the difficulties and pressures in my relationships. And you have said to those who ask, it'll be given. To those who seek, it'll be found. And those who knock, the door will be opened. Hear my prayer as I ask you to move in power in my relationships. You love me and will always do what is best for me. I know that healthy relationships are possible because of your love and grace. I want to trust in you more. I ask these things in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for being a part of this uh, service. I hope you've enjoyed watching these videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Or if you're listening to us on MP3, you can always download these uh, down to your personal device. You can listen to them while you're out uh, jogging or while you're in your car. Uh, you can also share them with your friends and family members. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.